in the name of Jesus drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall you welcome to another spirit filled message on christocentric message if you're new to this channel i would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video as well i would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth it's going to bless you your graces are going to be imparted onto you and then god is going to visit your home thank you for watching stay blessed Shall we lift our hands to heaven and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts? The Bible declares the entrance of your word gives light and understanding unto the simple. Go ahead and ask the Lord for an encounter by his spirit. It says they go from strength to strength as many as appear before the Lord in Zion. Is someone praying? Verbalize your desire. It says, ye have not because ye ask not. Father, give me an encounter on this special Sunday, this Father's Day. Let it be from glory to glory. For in Jesus' matchless name we've prayed. Father, we thank and we honor you for this morning. And we pray indeed that the entrance of your word will give us light and understanding upon our hearts. For in Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Thank you again. And please be seated. My, my message this morning um, would be a blessing to everyone. But I just thought to also use the opportunity to honor the fathers. And so I'm teaching on the topic that I title Abba Father. Abba Father. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. There are many names that God is called in the Bible. He's called Almighty, El Shaddai, El Gibor. The Bible is full of the various names of God. And when Jesus showed up, he was teaching what we call the Lord's Prayer. And he was giving them a pattern that would guide them whilst praying. And he said, in this manner, therefore, pray. And he said, our Father. In other words, when you submit yourself to prayer, you must come with the consciousness that you are not just praying to God, but you are praying to Father. Hallelujah. So the first point I want to establish this morning is that the Almighty God is also Father. As simple as this point is, it will alter your understanding of God when you know Him as Father. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 5, 5 and 6, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 5, the Bible in the Old Testament refers to God as Father, even though, theologically speaking, the concept of God's fatherhood was known when Jesus was revealed. Until the manifestation of Jesus, it was difficult for them to understand God as Father. Because the dealings of men with God was shrouded in a lot of mysticism. He worked with mediators like Moses, Joshua. And so the people did not have the privilege of a personal relationship. That concept of a personal relationship did not exist until Jesus came. Are we together? So they would have to depend on men who had a covenant with God. And whatever templates they were given from those men would be their understanding of God. For instance, Moses would climb up the mountain and interact with God alone. Then come down and give them the law and everything that he believed God told him. So they were limited by the understanding of God that was proposed to them by their leaders. Are we together now? Yeah. So verse 6. Let's look at it. Just a few scriptures to establish the fact that God is also called Father. Deuteronomy 32 5 and 6. It says, Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is that KJV? I appreciate KJV. It says, Is he not your father who brought you? 
he's speaking to his stiff-necked people now he's saying did you know that it took the fatherhood of god thank you he says had he not made thee and established thee so the bible acknowledges god as father isaiah 63 and verse 16 isaiah chapter 63 and verse 16 is the next scripture we'll consider establishing the fact that the almighty god is father isaiah 63 16 it says doubtless thou art our father though abraham be ignorant of us and israel acknowledge us not thou o lord art our father our redeemer thy name is from everlasting you believe that say amen so the bible establishes the fact that god almighty is father the second point i want us to understand in this discussion is that jesus revealed and established the fatherhood of god when he walked upon the earth now you see there are many reasons why jesus walked upon the earth ultimately was to reconcile man to god but you need to understand that many other things happened jesus came as a revelation of the father the Bible says no man had seen the Father at any time. So he came as the incarnate of the Father. That the invisible Father who had been shrouded in a lot of mysticism, Jesus came as a revelation of the Father. And here's what Jesus had to say about the Father. Matthew 11:27. Is God blessing someone already? Matthew 11:27. The Bible says, Matthew... 11 27 the book of matthew thank you it says all things are delivered unto me of my father and no man knoweth the son he says but the father neither knoweth any man the father save the son and he to whomsoever the son shall reveal so jesus you know one of the reasons why the scribes and the pharisees were angry at jesus was that he brought a dimension of relationship to God that, that was against their prior understanding of God. So they knew God as some deity somewhere with all kinds of emotional swings. If you were at the wrong side of his emotions, then you would die. If for any reason, perchance, you happen to attract his favor, then you would rise. And Jesus came and began to dispel that orientation. That this almighty God we talk about is not just about killing and destroying and giving victories, but he desires a relationship. Are we together now? So the theology of Jesus centered around relationship. Not just receiving things, not just using God for triumph in battle. And the scribes and Pharisees were angry because that would mean them overhauling their end entire understanding of God until Jesus showed up no man knew that there was a possibility for such an intimate relationship with God how dare you call the creator of the heavens and the earth father there are many religions today you dare not mention God as father are we together all things are delivered of me in matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 we read that earlier just right for reference so jesus is teaching to pray and it does not mention the word god he says when you pray you must approach this god with a renewed orientation call him father our father he said which art in heaven so even though you reside in a domain that is not earthly you are still father and he began to show that it is possible to be in a functional relationship with God even though you may not see him physically, which art in heaven. Then he says, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You are still speaking to the Father. He says, do not be afraid to ask the Father to give you this day your daily bread. Your daily bread is beyond food. It means all that is required for your sufficiency is called your daily bread. That means your father is that meticulous, is that benevolent to allow you ask him even for the things that, that make for your sufficiency. And then he says, give us this day our daily bread, the next verse, and forgive us. He was introducing something about God they had not known. Forgive does he forgive? I thought he destroys. 
Now Jesus is saying, forgive us our debts, even as we forgive our debtors. Then he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. I assure you they were confused after that discussion. Because here is Jesus giving them another side of God. Their understanding of God was a fearsome, mighty, invisible, mysterious entity somewhere who no one can really understand. If you are lucky, he will choose a, a leader and then show him a side of him. Now Jesus is saying, listen, listen. While all of that is true, there is a deeper dimension of knowledge to God. Are we together now? And in his parables, Jesus gave many stories and illustrations to show the fatherhood of God. We may not have time to consider that, but the most classic theological representation of the fatherhood of God was revealed in the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son uh, is a very interesting rendition of fatherhood and sonship because it starts by demonstrating the responsibility of a father like we'll be learning after now and then two sons one eventually became a rebel and it gives the son an opportunity to veer off as far as he's able to away from the father then in brokenness and repentance the son now begins to return back did you know that even in the fallen state of the prodigal son he did not forget that he had a father he said, I will arise. He forgot every, his friends left him, but the one thing that restored him was the consciousness of fatherhood. How many hired servants, he said, are with my father and I'm here feeding with the swine. He said, I will arise and I will go to my father. Not God. I am still aware that no matter how broken, no matter how far, there is something about the nature of fatherhood that must be willing to restore. He was there introducing all of these dimensions of God. You're blessed already. Say amen. amen. Jesus himself in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. He left us. He said that tarry until you receive the promise of the Father. He calls it the promise of the Father. Not just the promise of God. The promise of the Father. One last scripture. Ephesians chapter 3, please. 14 and 15. Do you love scriptures? Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. It says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15. Of whom the whole family... Now, this is Apostle Paul mentoring the church in Ephesus and he's reiterating what Jesus taught them. He said, listen, when it has to do with prayer and the faith work, you must have that orientation that you are dealing with a father who has a family of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Hallelujah. Now, the word father comes, it has the Aramaic expression Abba. The word Abba is, now you know theologically speaking that the Old Testament was largely written in Hebrew and then the New Testament was a combination of Greek and Aramaic. Are we together? Yeah, so the word Father is the Aramaic um, Abba. The Greek is the word Pater, P-A-T-E-R. Both of them refer to this. Please listen. To be called father means source, number one. Number two, sustainer. Number three, protector. Number four, provider. So in the mind of God, and classically speaking, um, a, an individual is described as father, not just using the basis of procreation. Now that is important. Are we together now? Our general concept of fatherhood is any man who is able to have a child out of himself. If that were true, that meant that Abraham should never have been called father until the arrival of Isaac. But he was acknowledged as father even before Isaac came. That means we have to use other parameters, scriptural parameters. We have to go into the mind of God to understand his concept of fatherhood. Is God speaking to us already? So that the first 
in God's mind, whoever originates a process is called Father, Abba, the originator. Number two, the sustainer of that process. That also includes family. Number three, the protector, defending the interest of the people, defending the interest of the business, defending the interest of the church. Whoever works in defense to protect is called Abba, Father. Finally, whoever provides. You know what it means to provide? To provide means to insist that there is no scarcity, to ensure that there is sufficiency at all times. That means in the mind of God, no matter how many children an individual has, respectfully speaking, if you do not pass this test of being a source, being a sustainer, being a protector and being a, pro a provider, you are not Abba. Is someone learning now? Yes. So when God calls himself Father, he gives you the opportunity to vet his fatherhood. Are we together now? He's not ashamed to say, you test it. If you call me Father, find me Find a place in scripture where I am not source. Find a place in scripture where I do not sustain. Find a place in scripture where I do not protect. Find a place in scripture where I do not provide. Then you can question my fatherhood. So every, the, the Bible is a compendium of the fatherhood of God. We see these attributes displayed once and again from generation to generation. The source, number one, the sustainer, Number two, the protector. Number three, the provider. Number four. Are we together now? Now, classically speaking, the concept of fatherhood, and, and please understand what I'm saying, the concept of fatherhood is not a concept that is left to men, like the male species. Are we together? The male species was carved out by God to embody this concept. But it is a concept that every responsible leader must understand. That concept of being Abba is not just left to men. Because you will find yourself in many occasions where an individual who is not the man would have to play this fatherly role. And for any, if you ever find yourself in that position of leadership, then you know that the mandate still remains Abba. So it is possible for a woman to still play that role to be a source, to be a sustainer. Are we together now? If you are the CEO of a company, for instance, with respect to that organization, you are Abba. And everything a father does must be captured in your leadership. So fatherhood is really a leadership philosophy. It is not just an orientation that is left to the male gender. Are we together now? But God in his wisdom chose a male based on his arrangement of family. Are we together now? To exemplify and embody his fatherhood. If you believe this, say amen. There are four assignments of fathers from scripture. Let's deal with it structurally now. Four assignments. Is God helping us already? Four assignments. And this, with, with all due respect, is now to the men as well as everyone. Number one, the first assignment of a true father is provision. No matter what else you fail in as a father, you are not supposed to fail in this. To provide does not mean to give food. To provide means to make available the resources that make for the excelling of your family. To provide means to make available the resources. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 11, Jesus now is teaching. When you read from verse 7, he says, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find. When we get to verse 11, Matthew 7 and verse 11, he said, If ye being evil, I like this, know how to give good gifts to your children. Watch this. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying intrinsically that the heart of man is desperately wicked and that even in that depraved nature of man, there is still the fatherhood instinct to see your family prosper. 
that even a wicked man has conscience enough to know that his children should eat are we together now if you being evil he said know how to give good gifts to your children he says how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him father provider 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 do you know as I describe the functions of fathers, men, I am also giving you the prayer point to know where the devil will attack you. Because Satan's attack will be to stop you from playing this role. So if we say the first role of a man is provider, that means he will come around your finances. That means he will come around everything that will incapacitate you and render you impotent to provide will be Satan's assignment. The assignment of every man is also the point of attack of the kingdom of darkness. Provider. 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 In 1 Timothy chapter 8, chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. Please help us, media. First Timothy chapter 5. The Bible says, But if any provide not for his own, is that in your Bible? He said, And specifically for those of his own house, he has denied the faith. Do you know what this means? That the faith experience of the believer is structured on the understanding of this fatherhood relationship. That means if you claim to be a Christian indeed as a man, you claim to know God and you deny fatherhood, it must be captured in your Christian experience. It says you have denied the faith and that individual is worse than an infidel. I pray sincerely for every man and every father here that every attack on your finances, every attack on your job, whatever it is that incapacitates you so that you are not able to provide in the name of Jesus Christ, let that attack come to an end this morning. Hallelujah. There are so many men around our world who are depressed today simply because of the inability to provide imagine that you pray to God and you say Lord give me my daily bread and you hear a reply from heaven I'm so sorry I do not think I have that ability now unto him is it in your Bible who is able to do God is always able to do that's what makes him father always able to do never wanting never failing in fact the bible says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think look this extent of fatherhood that even your thoughts he has the power to answer your thoughts number two the second assignment of abba as revealed from scripture is called protection please write to protect means to keep safe to protect means to stop from accessing danger. Protection. John chapter 17 and verse 12. John 17 and verse 12. The second assignment. Jesus is acting as a responsible father. Remember, he claimed to be the son of God. And that God was his father. Now he was exhibiting fatherhood to the disciples. And here's Jesus praying. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. That thou gavest me, I have kept. He says, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition. Look at a responsible father. He had to account for why Judas was not part of the fold. All that you have given me, I have kept. And none is lost, the Bible says, except the son of perdition. And that, that the scripture might be fulfilled. You are a true father when you know how to protect. Not just to protect men, to protect things, to protect values. Hallelujah. To protect. The father's discipline is his attempt to protect the child from an imminent decadence and decline that will happen in the presence of lawlessness are we together now the goal of discipline is not to vent anger no 
when discipline becomes a channel for venting anger then it is it is an expression of the absence of self-control are we together now the primary assignment of discipline is that it comes as a vehicle that ultimately protects the child i love your destiny too much i will not expose you to failure and I love you too much to allow you laugh in error and confusion. I'd rather you be sad with me now and say thank you tomorrow. Can I tell you, whatever brings a man to a point where you cannot discipline those who are within your household, you are signing in for failure and pain in the future. This is true. The Bible says a father chastises a son that he loves. Is that in your Bible? Discipline must be seen as an overall process that leads to protecting whatever God gives you. In fact, the Bible says, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which is committed unto him against that day. We're still together, say amen. amen. Very quickly, number three. The third assignment of fathers is mentorship and growth. Please write. Mentorship and growth is the third assignment of any father. When you read 1 John chapter 2, it's a long read from verse 1 to 14, but I'll just pick out a few scriptures. Apostle John is giving us a very intelligent discussion. He's speaking by the Spirit, 1 John chapter 2. And he spoke to three categories of men. It was a men discussion. I write to you, fathers. I write to you, young men. I write to you, children. He was addressing three generations. A child, a young man, and an elder. And he had something to tell these three groups of men. I write to you, children, that you sin not. Your tendencies your lack of self-control, you are still exploring the world, and in exploring the world, you will explore all kinds of things that will destroy you. So I write to you to caution you. I write to you, young men, you have strength, but you may not have wisdom. You must learn to manage your strength. I write to you, fathers, because you have known. Through your pain and through your experience, you may not have time, but you have wisdom. So pour your wisdom to those who have strength and pour your wisdom to those who have time. Young people have time and energy, but they do not have wisdom. The elderly have wisdom, but they may not have time. So mentorship becomes that bridge that connects wisdom with time. This is why every generation must be an improvement of the next. Mentorship and growth. Is God speaking to someone? When a child becomes a foolish child, the Bible says a wise son makes a glad father, but that a foolish son is a reproach to his mother. Are we together now? That means every father here, let me charge you by God. Do not hide your scars. Use your scars as a weapon of mentorship. Teach your child that I made a mistake and at 25 I was not yet established. Now you are 17. There is something I can teach you such that when you are 21, you would have covered my results of 30 years. Mentorship. Mentorship. Hallelujah. When Pharaoh, watch this. Remember the story of God's people Israel in Egypt when Moses came to advocate the exodus of God's people there was a negotiation that happened Pharaoh said all right I will let the children go but the fathers will remain and Moses said no if the children go without their fathers that is a generation without guidance and he negotiated all right let the women stay and let the men go if the women stay there is no continuity and he said, everyone must go. Notice how Satan, when he cannot destroy a generation, he will start fragmenting family. Men, you can go. Leave the women behind. When children do not go, there is no future. When men do not go, there is no stamina. When women do not go, there is no basis for continuity. Is someone learning now? Moses said, I'm not here to negotiate. The father, the mother... 
the children must go. That all three must serve. Let me charge every man here. Do not respectfully speaking. The school system is only supposed to be a support system to the training of your children. The primary assignment of every father is to sit with your children and become the clearest description of the fatherhood of God. Teach them responsibility. Teach them financial management. Teach them courtesy. Teach them honor. Let them understand the reality that confront our world today. And you would be raising champions. They may not look like it, but look at Jesus. When he called the disciples, he did not just lay hands to ordain them. Look at the ratio of impartation to mentorship. Three years to one day. Is someone learning? Let's hurry for time. Number four, the last and the final assignment of fathers, and this is where I want to dwell for a few minutes and then we wrap up, is continuity and succession. The last and the final assignment of everyone called Abba is continuity and succession. When I watched Pastor Gandhi speak here and he was speaking about his wrapping up his moment here, I just nodded and said, this is my sermon, emotion continuity and succession you are only as great as the great person who succeeds you no the greatness of your lifetime comes to naught if there is no successor this is respectfully speaking the tragedy that we have in our world today even within people of faith that they excel they spend decades of their life accomplishing great strides for the kingdom and in one year their testimony comes to naught because there is no one who becomes an extension of whatever it is that they did god forbid for every man here i shout that god forbid that that your achievements your sacrifices will not be buried because of the absence of succession you believe that say amen, amen. now you know why satan is attempting to attack your child he picks out the one with the potential to be a great leader. Did it not happen between Cain and Abel? The very first family, Satan attacked succession immediately. Because until Adam and Eve, Satan had never known that continuity can happen through reproduction. It was only through creation. It was Adam and Eve that were the first human species to show the possibility of continuity. And Satan said, this is dangerous. That means there can be many, many people coming through the womb of a woman that will serve Jesus. And there was an attack on Cain, and he made Cain kill Abel. The goal was that whatever it is, let it stop and not continue. It is why when we find people who are barren, we pray and say in Jesus' name, be healed. It's more than a miracle. It is the devil trying to stop the possibility of continuity. He is fighting that be fruitful mandate. Continuity and succession. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 22. I would want you to please listen I'm preaching something that I intend to preach a few weeks after now also. I have the honor of preaching for the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. Their global conference is happening in Africa. And this is one of the things that I hope I'll be able to share with the men. Um, I've been very inspired by that organization. And when God granted me the grace, I, I told them, I said, I'll come. I, I think I have some things that I want to share that I have seen many people build great conglomerate empires and at the end of their life they sit empty and angry and frustrated. The problem is not a financial problem. The problem is continuity. Was this not the frustration of Abraham? A great man who had everything and he said, Lord, what will you give me seeing that I go childless? Let's talk about this issue of succession. And he said, don't worry, it is not Eliezer. I am going to give you a child that comes from you. And Isaac to Abraham was greater than his wealth, his achievement, and everything. That was where God said in Genesis 22, don't turn there just for your knowledge. He said, Abraham, take thy son, thy only son whom thou love. Since he represents everything, go and kill him. Let me see how much you love me. And the Bible says, Abraham arose early and carried Isaac. 
So today we claim the blessings of Abraham, but we must take the responsibility of Abraham. Back to our discussion. Proverbs 13, 22. Proverbs 13, 22. Is, is the Lord provoking someone? If you can see it projected, let's read together. One to read. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the righteous. Most times, our attention quickly goes to the B part, but I want to talk about the A part. The Bible says a good man. That means among the many things that make a man good is his ability to have a proper system of succession. Can I wrap up my teaching by teaching you something about inheritance? The Lord opened my eyes to a very powerful revelation of inheritance. To inherit means to receive by succession. To inherit means to receive by succession or by will as an heir. Hallelujah. To inherit means to receive by succession. So the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And the Lord led me through a series of dealings and I came up with five things that every man here, respectfully speaking, at the end of your life, if you can leave these five things for those who have come out of you, you would have been a good man indeed. Can I run through the list as we wrap up? Let me request that you write it first in your heart and then on your paper. Number one, the first and the greatest inheritance that every man can give his son, that every leader, remember I told you fatherhood is not just left to men, the male gender alone. So this applies to everyone. Are we together? The first and the greatest inheritance you can give your son or those who come out of you. Are you ready? your convictions write it down it's amazing that most people when we talk about inheritance we're just thinking of land and estates and what is in the bank and unfortunately uh, i hope that god steps in there is a lawless generation that anticipate in a hurry the departure of their parents in hope that they will stumble into prepared blessings now i'm not being sarcastic it's with all due apology but it is important that we must understand that as sons and daughters, if the only thing you get from your father is money, you failed. It's true. Your convictions, a summation of your beliefs and your philosophies, because you know, like I do, that your life is a resultant effect of your philosophies a summation of your understanding about God, about life, about failure, about victory, the first inheritance that must be transferred from any man who is called a good man to his children are his convictions. Jesus was speaking about Abraham that I know. Genesis 18, you find that he says, I know, verse 17 and 19, I know that Abraham will teach his household. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I will do? Verse 18. He says, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed of him. 19. He says, for I know him. This is God testifying about a man that he will command his children and his household after him. What will be the command? That they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord might bring upon them, uh, upon Abraham, that which he had spoken. In other words, he's saying, teach your children, whatever made our relationship functional, transfer that conviction to your children. Number two, the second inheritance that every man must leave with his children is your name. Your name. Your name is a capture of your track record, your credibility, your impact, your value, your contribution. Let me take it again. Your name a summation of your credibility. Credibility can be transferred. Your track record can be transferred. Your impact can be transferred. 
respectfully speaking it is at this point that I continue to charge our great families especially in Africa because um, we are yet to understand the power and the value of succession in Africa you see I think that many have done a good job here in the West because you will find families and dynasties that are decades years old and they are still being run there are values they preserve the name but you know in many many of the places in Africa you find out that there's just one generation of everything it starts and dies with that generation the man is successful at 20 by 50 he's back to where he was and then he goes then the son comes paying the price of the father's carelessness begins his own journey and repeats the same thing God is speaking to someone if names were not important God would not change the names of men in fact he said oh Lord our God how excellent is your name how excellent is your name if names are not powerful ask the devil what happens when you mention Jesus if names are not powerful do you know at the end of your life your name can become a key that opens a door or a padlock that closes that door your entire lifetime is to translate your name to become a key or a padlock there are children today who have to change their names because if they were identified with certain names it would close doors for them and there are people who are in a hurry to claim certain names even if it's by extended relationship it is not my son name but just to let you know I stayed 10 years in that house do I qualify may your name be so great listen please hear me it is not it is not it is not enough to be great your name too must be great I hope you know you can be great and your name is not great Genesis chapter 12 in blessing Abraham he said I will bless you and make your name great what then is the difference he already said I will bless you then he says but I will not leave your name behind a man can be blessed and yet your name is not great when you are blessed alone you enjoy that blessing in your lifetime but when your name is great others can carry that name even when you are not there hallelujah praise the name of the Lord if authority was not invested in the name of Jesus we would just read that the Son of God walked upon the earth did exploit and that's it the early church will be a defeated church but he left us his name he invested all power and all glory in that name and said go in my name your name it means you must protect your name by all means it is better to protect your name than to protect your money your money can go down and you will find it but when your name goes down it will take the grace of God to get it back up dearly beloved I hope you were blessed by this message do not keep the video to yourself share to as many as you can to help them bless check our home page for more of our messages, subscribe to the channel, comment on it, like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. the face of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.